welcome Community Church family. Uh, this is appropriately awkward on this end. So we, uh, I can't tell reactions, I can't tell if people are listening, but um, we wanted to first and foremost spend a couple of minutes together um, and be able to talk about why we're doing things this way. I want to give a, a short teach in terms of what's our responsibility go forward from here. Um, and then we're going to move into a worship service. So the worship team to come, they're going to play some, some songs. We're going to be able to worship together. Pastor Dan's going to give the message. I had planned to not be in town this weekend um, several months ago. And uh, so Pastor Dan got a short straw that he has to do the first very awkward message. So thank you. Uh, first, I want to start why we're doing this. This is obviously we, we live in um, a, a different time right now. There's a lot of things that are unknown and there's a lot of decisions being made in a very short amount of time. I certainly am no medical professional and I don't claim to be. Um, we're trying to rely on as much information as we can gather um, and we're trying to be good citizens. We're trying to make sure that as the government declares states of emergency, as the, the government says that that gathering in larger places or gathering in larger groups together is a significantly high risk of transmission. We want to make sure that we're, we're somewhat sensitive to that. And so we're not, one of the words that I used in the email that I sent is we're canceling uh, services. And we're not. We're not canceling services. It was a poor use of words, and I think panicking people. This isn't a time of religious persecution. This isn't a time where we're operating out of a place of fear. This is a time where we're trying to say, we can still bring the gospel of Christ. We have other avenues. We have other mediums. How do we do that? And so we're not canceling church. We're just bringing it in a different way. We're communicating in a different way. In fact, we chose to go to one service at 10 o'clock so that we could all be together, so that we all hear the same message at the same time. Other people can watch it throughout the week. How do we come together at one time to hear the same message to be able to worship together? So our hope is, and I have no idea how long this will go on for, or certainly our, our hope and prayer is, is it's just this week. But we don't know. Information is changing dramatically. We have a board meeting at 6.30 tonight. We're going to talk about building usage and, and what's our plan go forward. And I guarantee you we're going to come out of that with one idea. And we're going to move later in the week and probably have to change that. Um, certainly when I sent out an email, I believe it was on Thursday, where we said we have every intention to continue to meet as a family. It wasn't. 24 hours later, we're sending out another email saying that has changed. And so this is an extremely dynamic situation. And so our, our desire is that we do the best that we can with the information that we can and that we're not adding to the potential problem. And so I want to move into a piece of scripture that's come up in a bunch of different ways. And I think, I think often we're using it a little bit out of context and we don't understand um, what our position and role is in this. And that's 2 Timothy chapter 1-7. Says that God not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but one of power, love, and self discipline. And so I want to talk about that for a little bit because I want to tell you that community church, that your leadership here at community is not responding out of fear to this. There is no fear from the leadership. We're not afraid of the coronavirus. And in fact, every one of us to a, to a man believes strongly in Paul's point of view to live as Christ, to die as gain. One, we don't understand exactly what's happening out there. As I said, I am certainly not a medical professional. We have a medical professional on our board that we, we trust. But we're not afraid. We're not afraid. We don't live in fear. And we also don't believe that we're pulling away. People are saying that, that as we close church, we're not closing churches. As I said, the idea of cancellation is the wrong word. We're operating differently in these times. We're not looking. In fact, one of the conversations we're having tonight is how do we build out a plan of communication so that we make sure that as a church, we've got a very strong online presence. Ashley has done a great job of bringing us an online presence for exactly these types of purposes. How do we do this well? And none of us want to give up on the gathering together of the believers. None of us do. This is one of the highlights of my weeks is to come together. I love seeing people. I love, I, I said in my note, man, having a, a handshake and a hug from people is a highlight of the week. This is painful, right? This is part of the suffering. To not to, to do it this way is as awkward as it can possibly be. And to try to do it in one take. I, when we do it this way, I usually have a bunch of different takes. I don't have that privilege. We're live. But we're not operating out of a place of fear. We're operating understanding the rest of that verse. That verse said we have been given the spirit, power, 
of love and self-discipline. And this is really where responsibility is go forward. Our, our dynamics are constantly changing. The sea is constantly shifting. But how are we going to respond as a body of believers? How do we respond as individuals in this? And that will be critical to who we are when we come through this. Unless this is the, the end of days, and if it is, I hope to see Jesus clouds this afternoon. But if it's not, if we continue, and I suspect that we will continue, how come out of this is going to be critical? Where we're at on the other side of this, where we don't meet for just this week, whether it's months, I have no idea. But I can tell you how we come through this is going to be critical, and not just us, right? I'm saved. If this church is, is divided and there's no unity and we're not a good light to Christ, my salvation is secure. I'll still see Christ. And I was just talking to somebody earlier who had a dream that they were fishing with Jesus. I'm going fishing with Jesus. If we die today, I'm going fishing with Jesus. I'm not worried about it. I don't live in fear. But I do have fear of how we respond as a body and the light or the lack of light that is shown to the world. I do have fear for those who do not know Christ. I do have fear that when we're able to gather again as a body, have we strengthened as a family through this or has it diminished us? We are a light. We're called to be. How will we do it? And not just whether or not we meet on Sunday mornings or not, but how are we going in Christ throughout this event? And again, that brings us back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. In the back half of that verse, he says, We're not given a spirit of fear or timidity, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. So power. Where's our power? Is our power found in, in meeting together? A, a, a church who's, who's choosing to meet this morning is saying that they're being faithful and the other churches are not being faithful. That's not our power. Our power doesn't come from getting together a Sunday morning. Now, it is certainly helpful, and the gathering is good, and we're encouraged to do it, and it's motivating and inspiring, and we should be here. But where does our power come from? Our power comes from God. The spirit that we've been given is God's own spirit. That's where the power comes from. And so where do we rely in times of trouble? Where do we rely in times that are unsettling? Are we reliant upon a building? Are we reliant upon a, a greater body? Or are we reliant upon the very power of God? And I want to encourage us, first and foremost, that we understand the spirit that we've been given. The spirit is one of power. We have power in this. We are not operating out of a place of fear. We are not operating out of a place of, of diminishedness. We're not operating out of a place of, of that we're being relegated to the side. Who has power? God has the power. And who has he given to us? Us as believers. So what are we doing with it? What are we doing with that power? Are we angry with each other because we don't understand the what's the dynamics of the world? Are we angry with each other because we don't appreciate the decisions? Are we angry with each other because we're falling on different sides of the issue? Well, we're diminishing the power that we've been given. When we anchor on the power of God, when we anchor especially collectively on that power, then we see the beauty of Christ. We see the fullness of God be displayed. And it's going to take that with, for, in order for us to be a light to the world in this. And they need light. As I said in my blog that I sent out a couple of, or I think a day before we, we moved away from in-person services, we have the hope that this world needs. We have that hope. That very power, that power of hope is in us. That needs our focus and that needs to be our aim. He also says that we're given a, the spirit of Love. What does it mean to have the spirit of love? I mean, that was one of the conversations that as a board we're trying to figure out. What is the most loving thing to do in a situation? Oh, our mission statement is to love Jesus, love others, and serve. That's our, our mission statement. So as we say that, that we desire to love Christ, we want to meet, even if it's like this, even if it's as, as kind of cold and distant as this is, we want to meet. We want to understand who Christ is. We want to go in that truth. We want to love Jesus with everything that we have because of what has been done already. We also want to love. What is the most loving thing we can do? If we're a point of transmission, if some of the people in our church are in a susceptible range, if people in this community, we meet and we're a transmission point, and we take that out into the community, is that the most loving thing that we can do so that we can continue to meet the way that makes us comfortable? At this point, we're saying that we want to love well. 
the last thing that we want to do in this, we have, and I didn't ask anybody for permission, but hey, they're not here, so I can say it. And I hope that, that no one takes offense to this. But I think of people in our body like Les and Michelle Weston, and I know they're watching. Hi, Les. Hi, Michelle. They've self-quarantined them because they're not in a great place. They're not healthy enough to be able to handle this. And we as a church, while they're self-containing, I know there's several people who are like, I want to bring them food and I want to do something for them. And that seems loving on the surface, but are we introducing something else to them unintentionally? What is the right way for us to love? And we're trying to navigate all of that. It's different. It's changed. The way we loved yesterday is different than the way that we love today. How do we do it well? We've got other people in our body who will who will continue to be here if the doors are open that certainly are in a susceptible place. And the last thing that we want to do as shepherds of this flock is introduce people to something that could be potentially fiddle or at the very least debilitating. And I know that we can anchor on the side, well, we need to have faith and we need to trust. But as I've shared with several people throughout yesterday, if we have a big snowstorm, we're going to cancel church based on the safety of people. We don't want people to feel compelled to drive in weather that could be dangerous. It's the same thought process. We're trying to be as loving as we can be. We don't, we're going to get some of it wrong, and I appreciate that, that as a family we've got to talk about those things so that we can get it the most right as we can. But understand that's our point of view. It's not driven out of fear. It's driven out of love. And how do we be as loving as possible? And not just to our body. But if we be a transmission point here together, it doesn't stop here. It moves outside of here. We, do we become a transmission or a point of spreading for people not even connected to the body? And is that showing love? Or is it more loving to do everything we can within our civic responsibility, be obedient as we can be to the governmental suggestion, trying to make sure that we're doing our part? That is where we've aligned to at this point. We believe that that is the most loving approach. We're not saying that it's right, and we're not even saying we like it, but we're saying that it's not driven out of fear, it's driven out of love. The last point is that we've given a spirit of self-discipline. That's on each and every one of us. We've been given a spirit of self-discipline. Where do we go in trying times? Do we do we point our frustration and anger? Because we all have it right now. We all have frustration and anger and uncertainty. Do we point that anger and frustration internally at each other, at the rest of the family, at other brothers, sisters in Christ? Do we turn that inward and do we become divisive and, and splitting among the body? Or do we exercise self-discipline? Do we exercise a love? Do we exercise a knowledge of the power of God? That's what I'm going to encourage us into the family, is that these are, these are different times. None of us have gone through anything like this. There is no roadmap. There's no plan. It's not like we were given a handbook for churches and says, do this. Every church is a different size. Every church has a different a composition of people. Every church is in a different part of the world. We're all trying to navigate this. And we're trying to do it as best we can through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the very power of God through his love, and through our own self-discipline. What is easy for us as a body? To meet. That's the easiest thing to do is meet. I, I, if you understood the amount of effort that went into just making this possible, the amount of emails and texts and conversations and meetings just to execute this, this is not the easy option. And as I said earlier, it's not even our desired option. Our desired option is to meet. I also want to clarify one point is that as we're, as we're saying that we're meeting, um, you're meeting with your family, you're watching this live stream. I don't know if this is the last Sunday of this. Certainly that's our hope and prayer. But if it's not, I would encourage you to meet in groups. I would encourage you to take your small group. If you're in a small group, meet a small group on Sunday mornings at whatever time that, that we decide to do this. If it's 10 o'clock, meet at 10 o'clock at somebody's house, a small group, so you can worship together. The acknowledgement isn't that we can be around people. The issue is we shouldn't be gathered in large groups of people in confined spaces for long periods of time. And that's exactly what happened in a worship center. But we're not saying don't worship together, and we're not saying isolate yourself from the body. We're not saying separate at all. In fact, we're going to meet after this service, Ashley, Maureen, and I, to try to figure out how do we make sure we stay connected as a body because we need to be more connected today than we even were last week. 
How do we do that? What does it look like in this in this new world that we're navigating? We don't want to isolate, and we're not trying to separate, and we're not trying to push people away. If anything, my hope and prayer is as we go through this, that coming out of this, that we are more united than when we went in it. And not united just as family, but united on Christ, united on the foundation. Because the truth is, I don't have the answers. The Bible doesn't have the answers. Even those who think we have the answers don't have the answers. But God got this. This is all under control. This may seem, you read the news, you look at the media, you read the reports, it seems out of control. It is not out of control. In fact, if history holds true, and expect that it will, coming out of this, there will be something beautiful that happens. Come out of this. God will rise up. You look at the Old Testament. God used every plague. God used every sick. God used every social disruption to show his great name. God used every way possible so that people would be pointed back to him. As I said, I was talking to, to somebody earlier, and they said, this is the great shaking. Oh, it is. It is. And what are we going to do in it? Are we going to be shaken to the point where we're frustrated with each other and we're angry and we're separated and divided? Or are we going to be shaken to the point that we see that there is a great need in our communities and in the world for Christ? We do not have the power, the, the spirit of fear, but yet so many others do. That we've been given the spirit of power and love and self-discipline. That we have hope. And are we going to anchor on that together so when we come through together that we will be stronger? And not just us individually, but this community that more people enter the churches, that more people would enter relationship with Christ, and that we would be a model and example. And my prayer encouragement today is not that we be anchored on decisions that are being made or things that are frustrating or the uncertainty. My prayer and hope is that we would be anchored on how do we bring the truth of Christ to people in this time. And how do we so united together that coming out of this, when we get back together, whether next Sunday or a month from now, when we come back together, we love each other well. Stronger than we did before, that we're more united as a family because we're more united in Christ. Do not allow the uncertainty. Do not allow the, the difficulty in understanding decisions. Do not allow the, our lack of understanding as we try to navigate this new path diminish the spirit that we've been given, the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. We have been given an amazing gift, and this is a perfect opportunity to bring that back. There are people, I can tell you at work over this, these past couple of days, I've had no fewer than a dozen gospel conversations with people who have no interest in Christ. I mean, what an opportunity. What an example that we can go to people and we can speak truth. People are shaken and people are scared. Let it not be us. And even if we meet differently, even if we can't meet in a large group, it does not change who our God is. It does not change who is in control. It does not change the spirit we have in us. It does not change our mission. It does not change our purpose. If anything, it should resolve us together in it. Today has been declared by the president a national day of prayer. And so I want to kick off this, this worship service with prayer. I'm going to ask that you do it with me. And I know it's uncomfortable to be probably in your room watching a, a computer screen or a TV as a family. But I'm going to ask you to pray together as a family. Not to just listen to pray, but to pray together. I don't even care if you put it on mute while I pray and you play, pray as a family. But I'm going to ask us to be lifting up what's happening. Not just the virus. I pray for healing. I pray for cure. I pray that this would be gone. But I pray for how we respond in it. And so my prayer is that together, collectively, as a body, that we would be praying, not just right now, but throughout the coming weeks through this time of uncertainty. So please join in prayer. Father, oh God, we don't have the answers. But we know that we have the answer. Oh, we don't know what is to come, except you've given us a, a good ending. You've told us that if we believe in you, that even in the last days, even at the very end, that we'll be with you for an eternity. I pray now, God, in this, this time unsettling, this time of shaking, this time of stirring, that we, as a body of believers, would be motivated action. 
that we would be brought into a place of, of healing. We would be brought into a place of, of unity, that we would be brought into a place of understanding what it means to be in the very power of God. I pray that this time would not divide us. I pray that it would unite us. And I pray that it would bring others to Christ. I certainly, God, pray for a cure. I pray that this, this be taken care of. I pray that we wake up tomorrow and that it's gone, that there's a cure that's done and there's vaccines and we can come together completely and fully. But God, we know in all of this that you're in control. I pray for our our governmental leaders. I pray for the president. I pray for his staff. I pray for uh, uh, the the sitting leaders. I pray for all the ones who are currently divided across the aisle. I pray that they come together so that they make the best decisions possible that are truly in will. I pray, God, that even at at a state level and at a local level, that you would continue to give clarity and wisdom, that you would not operate out of a place of either fear or even a a political gain, that this would not be some pawn in the name, but rather that it would be done in the best will of who you are and also what you desire to see happen in this world. I pray, God, that then we as a church, that we as a body would understand how to respond that we would know that we would have the clarity, vision, and purpose, that we would know what is more loving, that we would know what is best, we would know what is most God-honoring, we would know um, what appropriately represents what you would have us do. And I pray then that we do it. I pray that we rise up. I pray that individually we stand on that process and that we rise up and we be the light that we've been called to be. I pray that division does not rule the day, but I pray that hope and love and your peace is what champions. I pray for your salvation message to be preached. I pray for the gospel to come upon all people. And I thank you for the privilege of being used in it. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So our passage today that Pastor John's going to be preaching today is on 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 through 15. Paul says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in the prayers for you, their hearts will out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you have given us such a great gift of your love, and we just cannot ever thank you enough for that. Lord, please give us these opportunities today moving forward to be of service to our community and our church in new creative ways. If your spirit uh, burning desire into our hearts to portray your love to others, new creative ways, as I said, that we can um, move forward in trying times. Please, Pastor Dan, today, as he preaches your word from Paul's message and set our hearts on fire for you in your name. Amen. Everyone everywhere. Uh, so first and foremost, yes, we are aware of the unfortunate technical difficulties. And of course, of all days for us to have technical difficulties with our live stream, we decided today was going to be the day for that. So if you are still tuning with us, we want to just say thanks for holding in there and, and being with us. This is definitely new territory for us. And so to lighten the mood, I wanted to start off this morning with a joke. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good old-fashioned corny joke, uh, a little hard here with a bit of an empty room, uh, but I am sure that you've heard this one before. Okay, so when is a door not a door? When it's a jar, of course, <laughs> right? <laughs> old one, I know, but a good one. Uh, so I went online because I wanted to find more corny jokes just like this one, uh, and I came across somebody that actually posted this same joke online, and at first I thought, okay, like a bit of an old joke to be putting it on the internet, but uh, then I started looking at the comments, and, and so a Cub Scout 
Mayo says, ha, oh man, funny. So I mean, that got me thinking, I'm thinking, okay, this guy's gotta be sarcastic, right? That's, that's what's going on here. Um, and then Up and K-Man both say, good joke. Yeah, nice joke. And, and so that got me wondering, I'm like, have, have people really not heard this before? Uh, and, and so um, Matt Cornflakes chimes in and, um, well, you know, right off the bat, I'm thinking this, you know, maybe this guy's a millennial, maybe he's one of those Generation Z folks, um, because he says, I don't get it. <laughs> so um, user, user decides that he needs to help fill in what's going on. And so he says, well, a jar means slightly open, like when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. All right, so Van Van, who I just assume is a hippie from California, um, says, if you have a newer car, it says your door is a jar when it's open. Um, and, and then Anonymous, uh, he wins the prize here. Because he asks, so does that mean a jar that's slightly open could be a door? I suppose it, if it was a nice jar, then it could be a jar, a jar I adore. Get it? A door? Uh, look up at me and says, I don't get it. <laughs> so so here's, here's a new one for this morning. When is a series on giving not a series on giving? Well, when a passage about finances is not a passage about finances. Today, we are landing this six-week mini-series on giving and generosity that's, that's taught into the middle of 2 Corinthians. And all throughout, Pastor Adam has been saying, while this has everything to do about finances, it has nothing to do with finances. But really, at the center of it, it has everything to do with the heart. It has everything to do with what the Lord has done for us and in us and what he wants to do through us. But if we haven't allowed him to work within us, if we haven't invited him and his saving grace into our lives, none of this will make sense, right? Giving will then just be transactional, or it'll just be religious, or it'll be out of guilt or obligation. We'll feel like, well, I'm a part of this church, so I need to pay, or God will be mad at me if I don't give. Or worse, if I don't give, then God won't bless me. None of that is the right attitude or the right heart. Someone who gives joyfully, cheerfully, generously is someone who has had their heart and their life changed. It's someone who's been brought from death to life and is on God's mission to bring others out of darkness and into the light. And that light and that life is Jesus Christ. So when is a series on giving not a series on giving? When it's about so much more. Well, if you're not there already at home, we want to invite you to join with us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So grab your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we are looking at verses 12 through 15. And this is just a short section, just four verses that do an excellent job of concluding and clarifying this section on giving. So verse 12 starts off by talking about this service that the Corinthians will be performing. And Paul is talking about the financial gift that they will be collecting and then distributing to the poor in the church in Jerusalem. And actually, in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about a second journey that he took to Jerusalem after becoming a believer to meet with James and Peter and John. And he says that while he was there, they specifically asked that Paul would remember the poor, which he says is the very thing that he was eager to do. And we can see in his letters and in this collection, his eagerness to do just that, his eagerness to remember and serve the poor in the church in Jerusalem. That's the service that's talked about in verse 12 that the Corinthian church is going to be performing. And that word service, 
both here and in verse 13, can be translated as ministry. What they're going to be doing isn't just a public service or a charity, it's a ministry. There are spiritual implications, and Paul is going to lay that out. And he says, this service, this ministry that you perform is not only going to be supplying the needs of the saints, but it will also overflow into numerous expressions of thanksgiving to God. And I want to start by, by laying out a, a bit of a, an equation that I want to work out as we go through the text. And so the service that they perform is uh, gathering this generous collection. And so we'll say generosity, right? And, and their generosity will lead to supplying the needs of the saints. And so we'll say supply. But there's also something else that their generosity leads to. Paul says not only are you supplying the needs of the saints, but, and so much deeper, what you are doing is overflowing into many expressions of thanksgiving and praise to God. Generosity leads to supply, but more specifically, leads to praise. God will be praised through what they're doing. Yes, they will have given money, but they will have given so much more. Paul emphasizes that in verse 13, this notion of so much more and not only. He says, because of the service, the ministry that you're doing, others will praise and glorify God because of your obedience to the gospel of Jesus that you confess and is demonstrated in the generous gift. So Paul is not only expounding on verse 12, but he's now reversing the order. He's putting it in the proper order of importance. He's showing us why their giving is so much more than just giving money, and that what they're doing is not only meeting the needs of people. The equation then changes now to look like this. Generosity leads to praise because of supply. Supplying the needs of the saints is secondary in importance to the praise and glory of God, which is of first importance. But there's a new piece to the equation. Right? The generous gift of supplying the needs of the poor was birthed out of the Corinthians' obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's the gospel of the grace of God through Jesus Christ that informs the generosity of the Corinthians to supply for the needs of the saints, which then leads to the praise and glory of God. It starts with God's gospel grace, which informs generosity, and then that teaches them to supply the needs of others, which goes back to the praise of God. Everything flows out of God's gospel grace. And it changes who we are and what we do. Verse 14 then talks about the praise that God will receive because of the Corinthians' gift, because of this surpassing grace, it says, that God has given to the Corinthians. And it doesn't say that the Corinthians will be praised, but it says that because of the gift, the Jerusalem believers will turn to the Lord in prayer and longing for the Corinthians. There's so many times when, when people give, they, they look for recognition uh, to have their names printed or put on a wall or chiseled into stone. You know, the recognition that the Corinthians would receive is that they would be prayed for and interceded for, that God would be thanked for their obedience and their surpassing grace. And the Corinthians couldn't take credit if they even wanted to. The surpassing grace they gave isn't something that originated with them. They merely passed on the surpassing grace that was given to them by God the Father. It starts 
in God's gospel of grace, which then moves toward them understanding to be generous and then supplying the needs of others, which goes back to the praise and glory of God the Father. And verse 15 then finishes by saying, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And, and what is that gift? The money? The generous collection? No. No, it says God's indescribable gift. And what is God's indescribable gift? Well, Romans 6.23 says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift is Jesus Christ and his gospel of saving grace. So this verse is saying, thanks be to God for his indescribable grace in Jesus Christ. And uniquely, that, that Greek word translated as thanks is charis, which is almost always translated as grace. So from grace to grace. Grace be to God for his indescribable grace to us. From God to God. It starts with him and it ends with him. Not only does the equation look like this, starting with God's gospel grace, moving to generosity, to the action of supply, to praising back to God, but it also looks like this. Everything begins with God and his grace in our lives, and it ends with our praise for who he is and what he has done. His grace it gave us the ability to praise him, and it's his grace that we praise him for. This, this mini section on giving within 2 Corinthians started in chapter 8, talking about God's grace. It ends in chapter 9, talking about God's grace. The grace of God demonstrated in the gospel of Jesus Christ affects everything in the life of a believer. Can anything be divorced from the grace of God? No. The answer is no. When is a series on giving not a series on giving? When is a passage of scripture about finances not a scripture on finances? When it's about so much more. When it's about the grace of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ and how his example and his identity and his salvation changes us, changes us to reprioritize our lives, to reprioritize our actions, reprioritize even our spending and our giving. Yes, the Corinthians gave money, but they gave so much more. They gave and demonstrated the very grace of God, which led to his praise and worship. They gave out of their physical poverty, but they also gave out of their spiritual wealth. They gave out of the obedience that accompanied their confession of the gospel. When we confess the gospel with our mouths, the book of James says that our actions and our hands will prove it, right? Their hearts had been changed by God's gospel of grace. And they were now partnering with God, giving not just their wealth, but more importantly, giving the very same grace of God in Jesus Christ that they had been given. Well, you know me. I like to uh, land on application. So, how does this text, even this passage of Scripture, inform our lives? How do we live differently based upon God's words to us? Well, pastor and author Jeff Vanderstelt says, what God has done to you, he wants to do through you. What God has done to you, he wants to do through you. And to understand our identity and how we act out of that identity, we need to understand, we need to look at who God is and what he has done. And out of that identity and action, we understand our identity and action. And it looks like this. 
who God is, what he does, who we are, what we do. So as we look at a passage of scripture, we start by asking, who is God? How's he revealing himself? We move on to say, oh, what does he do? What is God doing in this passage? How do we see him acting? And then we look at the passage and say, who are we in light of this? Who are we to understand ourselves? And then because of all of that, what do we do? And it always goes from that direction, from left to right, from God to us. And so when we look at this passage of scripture, how does God reveal himself? Who is God? Well, God is the gracious giver. He's the gracious giver. And in this passage, what does God do? What action do we see him doing? Well, we see it in verse 15 that he gives his indescribable gift, Jesus Christ. So what does God do? He graciously and sacrificially gave his son for our salvation. That's who God is, and that's what he has done. And out of his identity and his work, we find our identity and our response. What he has done for us and in us, he wants to do through us. So in light of this passage, for the Corinthian believers and for us, who are we? Well, we are the recipients of God's sacrificial grace through Jesus Christ. Now, by any work that we have done, the church doesn't flow right to left. It always flows left to right. Because remember, it starts with God and it flows out of his character. We are the recipient of God's sacrificial grace because he is the sacrificial giver. Right? Because he is the gracious giver. Not because we have earned or worked toward receiving that grace. And so out of this new identity in Christ, what do we do? Well, what do the Corinthian believers do? They and we graciously and sacrificially give. In Christ, we have been made rich. And out of that great wealth, we graciously and sacrificially and joyfully and cheerfully give. First and foremost, we give the greatest gift that we have ever been given, Jesus Christ. But we also recognize that everything we have has been provided for by his grace. And, and that everything we have, whether it be our time or our talents or our treasures or our wealth, everything we have, we steward for his glory. We use for his glory, knowing that it's not ours, but it's his. It begins with him and it ends with him. And like this mini section I'm giving in 2 Corinthians, it starts with his grace and it ends with his grace from grace to grace. Well, in regard to, to living this out and walking in God's presence, here are the questions that I want to leave you with this week. First, do you know the grace of God found in Jesus Christ? I mean, have you been trying to be generous or meet the needs of others or do the right religious things, but don't know or can't articulate the gospel of grace found in Jesus Christ? The other things are of secondary concern. The first and most important thing is, to, is knowing Jesus Christ and experiencing a saving relationship with him through God's abundant grace. And then second, have you been trying to earn or justify your relationship as a son or daughter of God? Have you been working the identity chart backwards, trying to do all the right things or to earn or keep a position in God's family or to earn his grace? And to be able to call God your Father. Remember, He is the gracious and sacrificial giver that 
that's who he is. And what he has done is that he graciously and sacrificially gave his son for us so that we could be called sons and daughters of God and in following become gracious and sacrificial givers. We can't earn that identity. Our identity and our work flow out of his identity and his work. Well, I pray that the past six weeks in this mini-series on giving has taught us to first and foremost understand the abundant wealth that we have in Jesus Christ and that our sacrificial generosity comes from a place of overwhelming joy on what he has done for us. Well, as the band comes back up, I, I want to invite you uh, to pray with me at home. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I, I thank you for all the times. Lord God, you have seen times, times we have not seen in our limited lives. And through it all, you are good. And through it all, you are in control. And through it all, we can trust in you from grace to grace. And so, Father, we thank you so much for the great grace that you have given us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Father, we stand upon that rock of our salvation and we praise you for never changing, for being who you are and out of your great identity, showing us who we are in Christ. Father God, I pray that we would continue to lift high the name of Jesus in our homes, as we gather in smaller groups, and whether and however soon we get together again in larger groups. Father, it is about you, and it is about your glory. May we never put anything else before that. May we praise the name of Jesus wherever we go, recognizing that you have given us everything we need in Jesus Christ. And I pray it in his name. Amen.